Okay, everyone, good morning. We're gonna get started. I'll ask everyone to wrap up their conversations, please. Okay, I'm gonna say it louder. Good morning. Okay, you can do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. Awesome. Thank you so much for finding your way to Committee Room 1. This is our second gathering of the Civic Lab TO City of Toronto class. Um, let's just do a quick poll around the room. Who's here from George Brown? Hands up. George Brown folks here. Hi, good morning. Who's here from Centennial? Humber. All right. K. T. M. U. All right. U of T. All right. OCAD. York. Oh, no, I missed one of the three colleges. Which one did I miss at the beginning? Seneca. Where are my Seneca folks? Good morning. Hi. All right, so thank you everyone for coming. My name is Pamela Robinson. I'm a faculty member at Toronto Metropolitan University, the university that used to be called Ryerson. And my home school is the School of Urban and Regional Planning. I am the faculty host for today. We're gonna start this morning um, with an acknowledgement of the land. And because this meeting is both in person and virtual, for folks who are virtual, the land on which you sit may not be the land for which I'm gonna acknowledge. And I'm gonna use the City of Toronto's land acknowledgement. So for those of us who are here in City Hall, I'd like to acknowledge that the land that we are on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And it is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 of the Mississaugas of the Credit. The land acknowledgement is a really important thing, I think, and it's important to keep it as a living, breathing thing. I am a professor in the School of Urban and Regional Planning at a university that changed its name because we're trying to forge new ways of working with Indigenous communities of people. As a planner, it's always important to publicly acknowledge how complicit our profession was in terms of doing incredibly colonial and damaging work with Indigenous communities, among other equity-deserving communities of people. It's also important, I think, to acknowledge what the land acknowledgement means to us as individuals. Um, I don't know if you're aware or not, but this weekend, Nuit Blanche is happening. It's the all-night art event that's happening across Scarborough and Etobicoke and events downtown. How many of you have checked out the, the program for Nuit Blanche? Were you completely blown away by how many Indigenous artists are sharing their work? The focus this year is breaking ground. So it's this incredible opportunity to go and learn from artists who are Indigenous and from other communities of people who have important stories to share in the context of what it means for us to be on the land. And so I think as part of the land acknowledgement, it's important to connect both what has happened in the past, but opportunities for us to actively learn and move forward, especially giving, um, giving light to the fact that the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation is coming soon too as well. And so thank you for the opportunity to acknowledge the land. Um, I'm gonna introduce the class now. Today, our focus is on a well-run city and intergovernmental affairs. I think by the end of today, you're gonna to be surprised at how many cool and interesting things happen in a well-run city and when you think about intergovernmental affairs. And it may be something that you think about a lot and it may be something that you don't think about very much, but we're really lucky today to have three speakers who are coming to join us. I think all of the faculty members and students would like me to thank the City of Toronto staff who are both here to speak today in advance, but also the City of Toronto staff who do the hard work in front and behind the scenes to make a collaboration like this happen. This is a unique learning opportunity for all of us. It's only the third time we've done it. And I don't know, have, have any of you talked to fellow classmates or other people from other universities about what's happening? Who's told the story of this class? You should get out and do that because it requires a big commitment. And we'd like the City of Toronto to keep making that commitment moving forward so other people can learn. So I hope that you'll engage with me in a little act of um, paying it forward, um, public relations, and share the good work of this class. Um, a few bits of housekeeping before we get into the good stuff. It's being recorded today. Um, and so you're asked not to share any personal information within the meeting. Um, the session's available on Civic Lab TO and the Civic Lab TO curriculum website. And it'll be made available in the not so distant future. Um, last week's um, session should be up for most of you. And if it's not, you can ask your faculty member. Um, if you're in the room with all of us, you don't need to do double duty and be on the WebEx too. You can just be present and focused with all of us here today. Um, if you decide that you need to use the bathroom and take a bio break during the session, you're welcome to get up and go. The washrooms are just behind this room. So if you go out either of the back doors, they're like behind the clock basically, and you can find your way there. 
I'd really like all of you to be active in terms of thinking about questions for the Q&A period at the end. We'll take questions both from the room and from the WebEx participants. So um, please be active in thinking about questions. Um, and then the last thing I'll just ask you is if you're joining us um, remotely, please make sure that you have the mute function on so that we don't hear your dog barking when the letter carrier comes, okay? All right, so today I wanna to introduce three staff. I'm gonna ask each of you to wave as I say your names. We've got Stephen Comfort Conforti, who's the Interim Chief Financial Officer and the Treasurer for City of Toronto. We've got Paul Parsons, who's our Senior Corporate Management Policy Consultant from the City Manager's Services, and Aretha Phillip, who's the Chief of Protocol in the City Clerk's Office. So our order today is Stephen is gonna go first, um, and then Paul and then Aretha. And they've got really interesting presentations, and they've all practiced and they've got timed presentations so that we have time for question and answer at the end. Okay? Um, and I'll make sure when we're finished that I will ask folks who have questions in the audience. So get ready to put up your hand with your good questions. All right? And when it comes time to ask questions, you're going to go to the deputy's table. We're going to mirror what it's like to come and depute to council and you get to sit at the deputy's table, but I'll tell you how to get the mic on in a minute. All right. Stephen, I'm going to you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Steve Conforti. Uh, I'm the interim CFO and treasurer here at the City of Toronto. So before I start, I would like to say how happy I am to be a part of this amazing event um, for a third year now. Uh, and thank you all for participating in today's discussion and specifically for your interest in municipal government. Um, I've had the privilege and fortune to work in municipal government and finance roles over the last 17 years. Uh, and, and what has really been incredibly meaningful and professionally rewarding work. To share a little bit about myself, after studying business commerce in university, I began my career working for a small to mid-sized multinational corporation that manufactured flexible circuit boards. Um, some may be familiar, they're all in your phones today. Um, mostly for communication devices, aerospace projects. Um, I worked there for about five years, and given the size of the corporation, the way my role evolved over time, uh, and my interaction with senior management, I felt I was really able to grow and develop in that environment. Uh, I joined the City of Toronto in 2006 uh, in the financial planning division, first as a financial planning analyst responsible for providing budget, support, and advice for our city planning, municipal licensing and standards, and waterfront revitalization divisions. Uh, it didn't take me long to realize that my strengths and skill set really complemented the role I was in, um, and that I had a great opportunity to support my client division's financial needs and ultimately help shape the services and supports uh, that the city offers. The first few years here at the city, I was really, I was like a sponge. I just wanted to learn as much about the city services and financial policies and tools available to support them. Within a year, I was able to progress to a senior analyst role to take on larger and more complex programs like the Toronto Police Service, the Toronto Water Program, while also seeking out opportunities to support and learn from cross-divisional initiatives and working groups. Um, thing was, I wasn't doing this because I had career advancement goals. It was because I developed a passion for the public service, which I'm sure you're gonna hear from all of our speakers today. I also appreciated the importance of the role that I played, and I could directly see the benefits that Toronto were able to, 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 to achieve because of that. Um, six years ago, I took my first real risk. I joined the TTC as the head of finance and treasurer. It was one of the greatest decisions I ever made. It allowed me to gain uh, a program perspective to budgeting with a strong service focus rather than sort of solely a corporate view that I had held until then but also enabled me to support more than budgeting with involvement in areas like intergovernmental funding, insurance and risk, financial statements, treasury functions, as well as being a member of the board of the TTC Pension Fund. Uh, I was then able to return to the city's financial planning division as the executive director of financial planning four years ago, right before the pandemic, uh, leveraging my collective experiences as I was now responsible for leading the development of the city's operating and capital budget processes. I guess the second big risk I took was accepting my current role as the city's interim CFO and treasurer, which I took just this last June. I've been fortunate to be able to leverage that 17 years of experience I've had in municipal finance to help advance the city's long-term financial plan that was adopted by council last month and represents one of those foundational exercises that most of us only get to participate in a few times uh, over our careers. Um, I'll get into the significance of that work a little bit later in the presentation. So. Uh, enough about me. What's more important is the area I work in, and specifically the city's financial planning division that I'll speak about today. It's a division that is primarily comprised of financial analysts that are responsible for supporting each of the city's divisions, agencies, boards, and commissions. 
with key areas of responsibilities, including uh, providing timely and objective corporate financial advice, leading the development of the city's annual operating and capital budgets, which I'll discuss in more detail, uh, providing an independent review of the city's costs, benefits, and services. Uh, we monitor and report publicly on the city's spending and our performance. We also provide preparation for the city as we engage with external partners on numerous initiatives and file. Um, for today, I'll focus on financial planning's role in the development of the city's operating and capital budgets. Uh, the City of Toronto's 2023 combined operating and capital budget totals approximately $21 billion. Um, it's even larger when you factor the full $50 billion 10-year capital plan. Um, this is the largest municipal budget in Canada, and it's actually larger than most provinces. Um, I kind of I got ahead of you, but we'll go one more slide. <laughs> The, the dangers of having the presentation behind you rather than in front of you. Um, so just to level set, it's probably best that I differentiate between operating and capital budgets. Each year, the city prepares a single year operating budget and a 10 year capital plan. The operating budget is most often referred to as the budget that covers day to day expenses of providing services such as recreation programs, uh, curbside waste and recycling collection, daycare, public health, um, uh, emergency services such as fire, paramedics, and police, as well as park maintenance. Um, as long as these services are provided, costs will recur annually and need to be factored into the city's operating budget. The capital budget is a multi-year plan that provides for the total cost of tangible capital assets, either their renewal or their creation. Um, that's the total cost of constructing, improving, or extending the useful life of things like buildings, equipments, roads, uh, transit system, libraries, and you know, I could go on and on. Um, in developing these budgets, staff must ensure the budget is balanced. So this means that whatever we budget in terms of our expenses or expenditures must equal the revenues that we expect to bring in on an annual basis. This is a key and fundamental requirement of municipal budgeting. And unlike the federal or provincial governments, municipalities cannot run a deficit, meaning our annual expenses cannot exceed the annual revenue that we expect to collect. Uh, next slide. So as noted, uh, the operating budget supports, uh, sorry, you might be, yeah, one back please. There we go. Um, the operating budget supports the day-to-day -day expenses to deliver city services, many of which are provided 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The city is delivering more than 150 distinct services, often reflecting the services relied on daily by residents, businesses, uh, and visitors to the city. Operating budgets are developed for each of the city divisions and agencies. Uh, to develop a balanced operating budget, we must ensure that the added expenses due to inflation or new investments is offset by either savings or added revenue. Um, this is a key budget challenge as added costs generally far exceed annual revenue increases. To add perspective, the operating budget pressure as we look at beginning a budget process is usually about 500 to 600 million as we start that process that we need to balance or we need to offset. Now that 500 to 600 million in added expenses um, doesn't compare well to what a 1% property tax will generate. And a 1% property tax only generates about 39 million. So it really speaks to the actions that we have to take on an annual basis to balance the budget. Um, as part of our efforts to balance the budget, there's four fundamental considerations that we review. The first is costs associated with maintaining our existing service levels. So that could be inflationary increases to our cost of services, growth requirements in terms of the demands for those services, or even the full year cost for things that might've been initiated in the prior year. We then look at savings or balancing actions. So where are there opportunities to find offsets or reduce some of those costs? Uh, that could be an efficiency, it could be a service change, it could even be a line by line review that we undertake through the process. The third category is looking at new and enhanced uh, initiatives. So this is where we have priorities in the cities where we need to invest more or do more and identify what we might bring forward in the operating budget. Uh, and then the last component is what we call our future year outlook. And that's determining what do we think those pressures are gonna be in the following years based on the decisions that we're making today so we can plan and model for that. Uh, next slide. 
So the capital budget provides for the total cost of an asset's renewal or creation. So the city is responsible for building new assets and infrastructure, as well as keeping our existing assets and infrastructure in a state of good repair. The cost associated with this work is included in our capital budget. So the city um, assets have a replacement value of nearly $170 billion. The 10-year capital plan outlines investments required to be able to support this work. And it fluctuates every year, but it's in and around $5 billion a year. Um, when we develop our capital budget, we develop it with uh, a consideration against five categories, and it helps us prioritize our work. And, and in the order of importance, we will look at health and safety requirements as part of where we determine where we make our capital investments, legislative requirements, so where we're mandated to, to initiate some capital work, um, state of good repair, so that's investments we make in our current infrastructure to ensure that it's going to continue to perform, it's going to continue to be able to support the services that it, it does support. Um, then we look at growth-related projects and, and service improvements. So state of good repair funding traditionally reflects the majority of capital spending within the city's 10-year plan. Um, addressing state of good repair backlog is a key capital priority. Um, and even with half of our budget directed to state of good repair over the next 10 years, um, and significant investments that we've made in transit and, and community housing, we continue to see those needs grow and it continues to be an ongoing priority for where we direct our funds. Um, further capital investments are also influenced by our city's strategic plan. These priorities help shape budget decisions ranging from our investments in affordable housing and transit, which represent our two largest areas of capital investment, as well as the introduction of a climate lens in our budget process, helping uh, in decisions on how we invest. So this might look at where we would use our capital funds traditionally, but doing it in a way where we help advance our climate goals. That might be uh, procuring electric zero emission buses rather than a hybrid diesel. It might mean as we're doing building renovations, doing it to a green standard. Um, even most recently, we were looking at replacing the ferries that would take you to the Toronto Island, but doing so looking at electric ferry options. Again, all with the, the goal of advancing our climate, our climate goals. Uh, next slide. So I'll just quickly speak to the 2023 budget process. It's a bit dated and we're starting to head into our 2024 now, but I'll just give you a, a, a sense of what that process looked like, the complexities, and ultimately some of the decisions that were brought forward. Uh, next slide. So each year, uh, budget priorities are established to guide the development of both the operating and capital budget. In 2023, um, the budget established priorities as guiding principles that, that included maintaining frontline services like shelters, roads, parks and rec, long-term care homes, prioritizing emergency services and public safety, enhancing TTC services, um, supporting increased supply and safety of housing, addressing affordability, um, with property tax and rate increases below the rate of inflation, uh, limiting financial hardship on our residents and businesses, uh, continuing to manage sustained financial impacts of COVID-19, including reduced transit ridership and increased shelter demands. Um, also incorporated legislative requirements, such as achieving uh, provincial ministry targets for direct care and the amount of hours of direct care that we have in our long-term care homes. In addition to these priorities, our budget is also developed with an overarching priority of leveraging our budget process to advance equity responsive budgeting and as noted previously, advancing our climate goals. And uh, I think you'll hear more about that in future Civic Lot presentations. Uh, next slide. So I won't dwell on this too much. You can probably take a look at it when you have time. It's just walking through our budget process, both what happens behind the scene and administratively until it's ultimately brought forward to city council right from when financial planning would issue guidelines or technical instructions, submissions that come into, uh, into the financial planning group, reviews that happen between the CFO and our senior leadership team, and then ultimately staff will table a budget, we seek public input, we get support and guidance from the budget committee, it all culminates in when the mayor then tables a proposed budget, um, which has to be done by February 1st, and then is brought forward to council where there's some opportunities for amendments or adoption. Uh, next slide. So this is an interesting slide. Um, I, I had talked a little while ago around, we always have about a 500 to $600 million opening budget pressure that we have to balance. And that's, you'll see in this box, you see light blue and, and, and dark blue shades. That's inflationary pressures or, or growth demands on our services. What happened really uh, in 2020 is, as we were experiencing the financial impacts arising from the pandemic, 
is beyond that traditional 500 to 600 million that we had to balance, we also had this, these impacts arising from the pandemic on our finances. Most specifically, and what disproportionately hit cities like Toronto was the demand on, uh, on transit, or the impacts on transit and the demand in our shelter systems. So on transit, um, you would see that we had decreased ridership, which means less ridership revenue that the city is able to collect. Now, at the same time, we continue to offer those services. I think at our lowest point, we had ridership revenue that was only about 24% of what we would have collected pre-pandemic, um, which at the time was, was close to a billion dollar loss. At the same time, there was increased demand on our shelter systems, as well as the need for, for distancing in our shelter systems. We actually increased our shelter beds from 6,000 beds a night to 9,000. And as you see in the graph, um, while the COVID impacts are starting to diminish, not so much, well, we are, but, but not to the same extent in transit and shelters where we really are seeing sustained impacts. Um, but you would have seen them diminish in some of the other areas that were experiencing challenges. You know, the examples I like to give would be Toronto Zoo. At the onset of the pandemic, they would have less people visiting the zoo. You would have less revenue coming in, but you still have to feed the animals. So you still have the expenses, but you wouldn't have the revenues coming in to support it. While we're seeing those costs disappear, we are continuing to see the impacts on ridership on the TTC, where right now we're at about 76% of our pre-pandemic experience. But even more importantly, we break that number down a little further. And what we found was people prior to the pandemic that used the ridership on the, on the TTC on the weekends are actually using it more now than they did in 2019. Um, people who use the transit system one, two, or three days a week are actually using it pretty similar or even a little bit more. The challenge is people that traditionally use the system four to five days during the weekdays where those were your general commuters, those people taking transit into work, they're only returning to the system at about 56% of what they had traditionally been coming in at, which, which really speaks to the hybrid work environment and some of the changes in behavior that we've seen now. So we continue to have to provide those services, but we're receiving significantly diminished revenue, um, putting more of a burden on the city's finances and the property tax base to be able to support those services. So we did, open last year's budget pressure with a $1.9 billion shortfall. What we did as part of the process is we split out the COVID impacts from the base budget. We brought forward from, uh, uh, opportunities to be able to balance the base pressures, and that would be a combination of, of revenue actions, so that would be property tax increases, assessment growth, uh, new revenue opportunities. That was around 500 million that we identified there, as well as expenditure actions, where we were able to reduce expenses by about 300 million through, through exercises by line by line reviews, modernization initiatives, efficiency initiatives. And then what we did is we budgeted separately for the COVID impacts. We, um, we continue to assume that we would receive funding supports from the federal and provincial government, but at the same time, cognizant that they might not be forthcoming with those supports and that we had no commitment entering into the year, we developed what we call the backstop strategy, which is essentially since the start of the pandemic, we set funds aside into a reserve. These are funds that otherwise would have supported our capital program, but we set them aside in the reserve knowing that we may have to draw from those eventually if the funding support from the federal and the provincial government diminished, so we could still maintain a balanced budget even without that support. Uh, next slide. So ultimately, we did balance the 2023 budget, but we also made investments in some key priorities. So the budget focused on delivering core frontline services. We improved uh, emergency services and 911 response times in, in fire, police, and paramedics. Uh, we expanded sidewalk snow clearing, making it easier and more accessible to get around. We even ensured public washrooms and water fountains were open earlier in the spring and open later in the fall. Um, the budget also promoted the supply and safety of housing. Council adopted the implementation of the new vacant home tax, which is really a policy tool to increase housing supply. Uh, it also expanded housing options, such as the legalization of multi-tenant homes um, and enhanced investments in eviction prevention programs. Uh, the budget also ensured public safety. We, we uh, enhanced our community crisis response program, anti-violence programs, and youth employment initiatives. Uh, the budget also focused on affordability. We, we brought a property tax rate that was below inflation, which was very high last year, but it was still below inflation. Uh, we continued supports for need-based programs, and we made investments in transit, uh, expansion of the Fair Pass program, um, making that program, which represents a 30% discount to our fares, eligible to 50,000 additional people. 
Uh, we also approved our largest ever capital program of nearly $50 billion over, uh, over the 10 years to invest in priorities like transit and like housing. Uh, next slide. So I'll just quickly walk through the city's long-term financial plan. So uh, this was just adopted a few weeks ago, uh, ago by council. Some of you may have seen, there was obviously a lot of uh, media coverage on this. Uh, and it really speaks to the historical and now exasperated challenges in municipal finances and the need for a new municipal funding framework with the federal and provincial governments. Uh, next slide. So as we noted in our long-term financial plan, Toronto is the economic engine of Canada, but it's essentially funded like a side project. Um, a fundamental challenge we face today, and we face for many years, is that we contribute and are expected to contribute more to our provincial and federal economy than we're funded to support this hard work. Uh, this dynamic of giving more than receiving means we're not sustainably funded. Uh, Toronto needs revenue tools that recognize its role and contributions in the economy. While the Toronto region contributes to more than 20% of Canada's GDP and 53% of Ontario's, Toronto receives limited direct funding from the provincial and federal governments. The city expects funding of 2.7 billion from the province of Ontario this year, representing just 1.3% of the province's annual spending, of which 2.3 billion is for programs delivered in partnership with the province, such as childcare, long-term care homes, employment and social services, and public health, that actually comes as an expense to the city of 1.1 billion. Um, from the Government of Canada, the city expects $1.6 billion in direct funding, which is just 0.3% of their annual spending in comparison to our 20% of the national GDP. Uh, next slide. In addition to the economic benefit that the city provides both the province and the country, we also make significant investments in areas that are extensions of federal and provincial responsibilities or provide regional benefits beyond the city's borders. So you see on the left side of this graph, and I had mentioned 1.1 billion or 22% of our property tax base is actually provided in services that are extensions of federal and provincial responsibility. This includes over 600 million in housing services, nearly 250 million in social services, uh, again, over 250 million in health services. And that doesn't even include the funds we, we uh, incur in our capital budget to have the infrastructure in place to support that. Then we also look at the benefits that we provide the region. So just looking at transit alone, 13% of our transit rides either start or end outside of the city's borders. What that means is our property tax base is actually funding the equivalent of 155 million a year in subsidizing regional transit. Um, we're also the largest municipal shelter system in Canada, uh, which is relied upon to support regional demands and not just solely demands in the city. Uh, next slide, please. So our ability to generate revenue has been strained for years, uh, and yet our costs have continued to increase. We have a long-standing challenge that the city has faced for over 25 years, and funny enough, I even read a document recently from the 1970s that expressed many of the same challenges that we're seeing today. Um, you know, when we presented the long-term financial plan, and we usually present one of these every five years, I noted that we continue to face a lot of the challenges we've always faced, reliance on the property-based tools and, and not tools that capture economic growth, um, the complex scope and scale of city services, growing demand is outpacing the revenues that we bring in, critical infrastructure requirements. Five years ago when we presented a long-term financial plan, this was presented as an impending iceberg, a challenge we were facing. The, the metaphor we use this time around is we really are in the eye of the storm. It's not just those challenges we've always faced, it's some of these new challenges that have significantly worsened since the start of the pandemic. That's the sustained impacts of the pandemic, predominantly those on our transit and our shelter services. Rising inflation at 5.2%, which is the, you know, last year's number I think was the highest that we would have even seen since the 80s. Increased interest rates and cost of borrowing, which means it's harder for us to deliver our capital needs or, or it's more expensive for us to deliver our capital needs. Um, and we're seeing that in cost escalation. A lot of our costs are coming in twice what they would have cost prior to the pandemic, all of which is creating these immense financial challenges for the city. Uh, next slide. So based on the modeling work that we did as part of the recent long-term financial plan, over the next 10 years, the city of Toronto faces known operating and capital fiscal pressures totaling 46.5 billion. 
including growth and inflation, planned service expansion and capital investments and unfunded uh, capital priorities. The impacts are really broken between the operating budget where you see about uh, 7.5 billion in pressures over the next 10 years, uh, increased costs to be able to support the debt associated with our capital needs of about 9.5 billion. And then the largest component is our capital infrastructure needs where we have about 30 billion in funding pressures. Um, what we've done through the long-term financial plan, just to make this a little easier to, to comprehend, is looking at two distinct numbers as we head into the 2024 budget process. That is the shortfall that we need to balance for the 2024 operating budget, which is estimated about $1.5 And then the 10-year capital need that we need to address as part of our capital planning process, which is just under $30 billion. So next slide, please. What came from our long-term financial plan is that council adopted a series of options that collectively can mitigate and reduce the city's financial pressures. Um, we're also fortunate to benefit to some degree from past actions that include the introduction of a city building levy. The challenge is that applying the full suite of these approved options by council will not be enough to address the city's 46.5 billion pressure. We estimate that the city alone could only address about 40% of the pressure. On top of that, and what's become very evident through this exercise is that the options the city has the full authority to implement are generally limited to property ownership. That holds true for property taxes, land transfer taxes, vacant home taxes, and even parking levies that are ultimately attributed to property ownership. To address the remaining 60% of our financial pressure, the city needs a new fiscal framework with the federal and provincial government. We're also seeking authority from the province to implement new revenue tools that are reflective of the city's responsibilities and contribute to the economy, and specifically revenue tools that grow with the economy, like a municipal sales tax. Um, we're also seeking a new fiscal framework with the province and the federal government, one that provides fair contributions to critical services we provide that either offer regional benefits across the GTA, economic benefits across the country, or are delivered as extensions of the federal and provincial government um, the immediate focus of this being on transit, housing, and shelter services. Uh, next and last slide. So I was worried that this presentation was going to end on a somber note. Um, <laughs> and, and maybe that's where I am right now. The great news is that we had uh, fantastic news from the province just at the beginning of this week. Um, not only has the province acknowledged the city's financial challenges, um, but they noted that we cannot address them through service reductions or tax increases, and they've committed to a New Deal working group to achieve long-term um, stability and sustainability of Toronto's finances. For those of you interested in municipal finance, I encourage you to follow what comes from this working group over the next few weeks, or sorry, few months, which will be critical to the sustainability of the city's finances, and as important, the critical services that the city offers to those that live, work, play, and learn in the city of Toronto. So thank you all for your participation. Hopefully I didn't go too long, uh, and, and happy to take questions uh, when we get to that point. Thank you so much. We've got about three minutes of time to make up, so I'm going to pass it right to Paul, who's our Senior Corporate Man uh, Management Policy Consultant in City Manager Services. Paul, over to you, please. Thanks so much. You can just say intergovernmental guy. You don't have to say the whole, the whole title. But uh, yeah, thanks everyone for, uh, for having me here. It's exciting to be, uh, to be part of this. Uh, I'm really excited. My oldest son is uh, just applying for universities this year, so I'm very, uh, it's nice to meet uh, students, people going through the process right now. Um, uh, I'll talk a little bit about me and my background before we get into the presentation. Uh, I studied many years ago, studied planning at the University of Guelph. So it was rural planning. Don't hold, don't hold that against me, different than your planning programs that some of you are in, I think. Uh, I started working for the city of Guelph in a really interesting role there, uh, kind of a, a liaison between the CAO and the mayor's office, acting doing kind of intergovernmental stuff and research. And uh, that's how I got started down this path. And, uh, you know, in various iterations, I've kind of sticked with it over the, the last 20, 20 plus years. Uh, I started uh, coming out of graduate school, uh, started with the Ontario Public Service with the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, doing something called cabinet liaison. So again, a, a sort of a liaison person between the minister's office and uh, central agencies and, and the, the public service. 
Uh, I was about 14 years there with municipal affairs and housing, most of the time, other, other roles within the Ontario Public Service as well. I'd encourage anyone interested in public service, the OPS is a great place to work. There's lots of opportunities to move around and follow different interests while you're in, in technically on one career path. Uh, as part of my time there, I worked on something called the Provincial Municipal Fiscal and Service Delivery Review, which is the last time the province and the cities, uh, all municipalities in Ontario actually worked towards a, a New Deal framework. That was about 15 years ago. So I'm very excited to be uh, involved in, in this next New Deal framework that's coming up. Thanks, Steve, for scooping the only intergovernmental news <laughs> I had. But, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, after working... Uh, with in intergovernmental relations with uh, with the province for a bit at MMEH uh, came to the city about seven years ago, in you know in essentially switching sides of the table. So, uh, but uh, the same kind of role. Uh, so very much not a subject matter expert like Steve and uh, Aretha, but uh, more of a generalist. In the and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, so the first slide that comes up is uh, just a. Set the stage a bit, talk about uh, what is intergovernmental relations, what do we do? Ultimately, I think it's about uh, influence, persuasion, relationships. Uh, at the end of the day, it's about getting what we want, what to, what's best for Toronto, for the people of Toronto, uh, and kind of at a high level, really, to, to take a noble tone to it, uh, the best possible public policy outcomes between uh, levels of government. And, you know, you'll see sometimes politicians will talk about how there's only one taxpayer or, you know, we want what's best for residents. You know, that's the, that's the idea with, uh, that's always in the back of our mind. Um, what we actually do, what intergovernmental relations actually is, how it manifests, the different forms it takes, uh, that kind of varies. It's going to depend on the issues we're looking at. It's going to depend very much on the personal style and preferences of the lead actors, namely the, the politicians. Uh, it depends to a certain extent on partisan alignments uh, and also where we are in the electoral cycle, whether there's a minority or majority government, uh, different orders of government, that kind of thing. So we have to consider all these complex variables. Uh, and obviously we're at a very interesting inflection point right now. We have a a new mayor with uh, with strong mayor powers, whether she wants or intends to use them or not. Uh, we have, uh, you've, you've probably heard, we have a new Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing at the province, uh, and we have a minority government at the federal level, which uh, makes for a very interesting dynamic and I think gives uh, the city a, a little bit of leverage. And, uh, and I've tried to reflect that in the, in, the, in the pictures that I put on the slide here. So, you know, uh, the mayor, have a little chat with Justin, Nice to meet you, Justin. Have you met my friend Jagmeet up in Ottawa? And uh, the bottom, the bottom slide showing, of course, uh, you know, our our mayor is the the intergovernmental spokesperson, taking a very strong tone. I like that forceful. The fist is good. Premier looming in the background, and uh, sort of the ghostly image of uh, the last mayor, because of course we always, we're always we're always doing our work within a within a you know a political and historical context, and so that's very much. Very much on our mind, and of course, the pandemic is, uh, as as Steve so ably set out, that's had a huge influence on uh, on on city government. Um, next slide. Uh, we have a very clean and simple illustration to uh, describe what's actually, I think, a very messy and iterative process. But it, you know, I think it's an illustrative example, um, just setting out who the players are. Um, up top there, we have the political actors. So the mayor is the city's voice with other orders of government. Um, she also kind of has a bully pulpit. You know, she's who the, the, the people look to and the media look to when they're looking for a soundbite or someone to represent the city's positions. Uh, council members can also play a leading role. So we have uh, a, a budget chief appointed by, uh, by the mayor. We have, we've, in the past, we've had a, a housing advocate. The, those kind of positions can, can come up and be important at different times. Uh, sometimes the committee chairs at council, so the chair of the, the Board of Health, for example, will sometimes speak out on those issues, or the chair of the Infrastructure and Environment Committee will, will speak to those issues. Those are a little more ad hoc, but uh, you know, depending on the issue, they'll take the lead. Um, you can tell this design of the slide came from the city manager's office, because it put us at the center there, the center of the universe. Uh, and I'll talk uh, in more detail about what we do, but really it's a, a, a liaison, an overview, uh, corporate leadership and, and strategic alignment role. And then, of course, the divisions, uh, the subject matter experts within the city, 
incredibly complex, incredibly varied, everything from, you know, solid waste and who picks up the garbage to, uh, you know, strategizing about uh, uh, the next 10 years of, uh, of transit expansion. Uh, and you can sometimes add, I almost think we need another box on this slide for the city's agencies, our agencies and corporations. Uh, they spend, you know, more than half of the, the, the city's, uh, they account for more than half the city's spending. And some of those agencies are sufficiently large and complex that I think they take on an intergovernmental role sometimes, especially I'm thinking of the police or the, the TTC. Uh, and even some of the smaller ones will have uh, a certain aspects where, they, where they're speaking and dealing with other orders of government. I think of our civic theaters, Geo Live, where they're, they're intending to redevelop the St. Lawrence Center. I mean, that St. Lawrence Theater, that, uh, that could very well, I think, involve uh, some liaisons and discussions with uh, other levels of government. Um, so these actors all work uh, in a decentralized way, but they also work in a coordinated way, and sometimes they work all together. An example I'll give of that was in uh, 2019, the province came out with uh, uh, their annual budget. It had certain impacts, very, we think, dire impacts, would have had impacts on the city's budget and for municipalities in general. Uh, and it was a real occasion for the mayor spoke out, um, uh, the city council took a position, we worked with other organizations like the, the big city mayors and uh, other organizations we'll talk about in a minute. Um, the divisions, especially Steve's area, did a lot of work coordinating and figuring out what the impacts on the city were, would have been. Uh, and our office uh, brought all that analysis and research together, packaged it up into a, a, re a report to council. Council took a position. They decided to start a public advocacy campaign. There was a, a website and people were encouraged to write to their uh, provincial members. And in the end, the, the province actually responded to all that advocacy and intergovernmental nudging and uh, they backed down on many of those changes. So there was, you know, I think a real example of how all the different actors sometimes have to come together to, to make things happen. Um, the next slide, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about what uh, my office does, intergovernmental and agency relations. Um, so at the center, of course, in that diagram. Um, we like to think of it as, as a uh, strategic overview, facilitating role. Uh, it's the best job, in my opinion. It's very generalist. As I said, I'm not a subject matter expert. You sort of have experience and expertise accruing over time and, and people in my job and this kind of job, you often see them in these roles for a long time, maybe not always in the same position, but uh, they could, you know, maybe not even in the same municipality, municipality necessarily, or is with the same order of government, but doing this, this similar kind of work exists at uh, all different orders of government and across in different areas. Um, our office in Toronto is uh, very much not a central agency. It's not like Privy Council office at the, the federal level or cabinet office at the province. Uh, we don't have that same authority to directly manage the policy agenda, but it's more of a, a soft power role. And we, and we can, you know, we, we kind of fade in and out of the mix as needed. We'll take the lead on an issue for a time and then hand it off to the subject matter experts is often how it works. Uh, an example I can think of is uh, Ontario Place, where uh, the, the province a couple few years ago um, started up that redevelopment process again. Our office was writing reports and getting a, a, you know, a table with the province set up, a part, an, an agreement to, to work together. Um, and then you know, we've handed that off now and it's, it's going through the planning process. And the city planning and the waterfront secretariat are, are very much leading it. Um, the next slide talks a little bit more about, uh, more specifically, what our office does. Um, uh, in terms of advocacy, we're trying to make sure that the city speaks with one voice, that we're consistent, not contradicting each other. Uh, in a large, complex organization, that can sometimes be an issue, and it, it means managing competing priorities and, and competing points of view, and, and our office helps resolve that and, and make sure we're only putting one out in public. Um, we do direct advocacy sometimes, especially around uh, budget time and on economic statements to the federal and provincial governments. Uh, we develop relationships and maintain those relationships. We meet with counterparts at the province and the federal government, and uh, that'll tend to happen regardless of whatever political firestorm of the day is happening. We, you know, we have our staff relationships, so it, you know, even if things are, are 
on fire politically, there's a, you, can, you can be sure that there's always a back channel where we're still talking to people. Um, we also work on partnerships with other, other uh, advocacy and, and sector organizations like the Ontario Big City Mayors and the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. I'll talk about them a little bit more uh, on a later slide. Uh, we support intergovernmental meetings, um, you know, the one the mayor had with the premier the other day, um, good outcomes from that, uh, but also uh, the lower profile ones where it's, it's just staff to staff talking with, uh, you know, ministry officials or department officials in the federal and provincial governments on a specific issue, we support those as well. Um, and finally, we, we coordinate applications to, uh, to funding programs so that uh, we don't have divisions within the city or city agencies competing with each other for uh, limited pots of funding. It's a key role. Um, oh, and of course, intergovernmental tables that we uh, participate in and, and sometimes co-chairing. Um, this next slide talks about federal and national municipal relations. Um, we, Toronto, uh, most of our federal relations are managed through the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. We have Toronto by rights has uh, two board members on, uh, on the FCM board. So Deputy Mayor McKelvey and Councillor Bradford are reps right now. Uh, we also have a couple of what are called non-board members that sort of uh, strengthen our voice at the table. So Deputy Mayor Malik and Councillor Ainsley are non-board members, they can participate in committees. Uh, they don't have a vote at the board table, but it's still another window into the work they do and, and a little bit more influence for Toronto, recognizing that we are, you know, uh, a little larger than the, the, the average bear at the table there. Um, the Big City Mayor's Caucus is another, another way we, we, we work that angle a little bit. That's the big six cities, so Toronto plus uh, Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, Ottawa, Montreal, uh, all meet on a regular basis, the mayors, and they uh, advocate for kind of big city issues, if you like. Um, BICEP, great acronym, is the city manager's forum that mirrors this table. And uh, BCIT, the big city intergovernmental table, is uh, the, kind of the kitty table where, where I go. We have a round table with uh, intergovernmental staff, and we get key updates from uh, federal staff representatives from you know, Privy Council office and uh, INFC and other, other ministries that uh, have you know, relevant agenda items for us that cities are interested in. Um, next slide talks a bit about uh, provincial relations. Um, the province is a little different. We're much closer to them, literally just down the street from Queens Park. And uh, the way our constitution works, of course, you know, provinces are all up in our business. They, they manage our key legislation and uh, a lot of the, uh, the funding agreements we have are with the province. Um, so in terms of intergovernmental cooperation, we actually have a formal agreement with them. Uh, it was mandated through the City of Toronto Act. Uh, this is called the, the Toronto-Ontario Cooperation Consultation Agreement, also known as TOCA. Um, it's just a, an, a, a voluntary agreement. Sadly, there's no token jail for anybody violating it, um, much, as, much as I'd like that. Um, but it's just a voluntary agreement. So the governments of Ontario, the government of Toronto, City Council, agree to consult each other on matters of mutual interest. And we have a confidentiality agreement within that. So the idea is that before things go public, before they hit the ground running, we have consultation in advance so we can work things out ahead of time. And we get, you know, an early, even if we don't necessarily agree with what's happening, we have some early uh, input into it and, and can hopefully influence a bit. Um, the TOCA agreement has just expired, actually. It had a four-year term. It uh, was signed by, by Mayor Tory and the previous Minister of Municipal Affairs in 2019. It expired in September. So, you know, very timely. We have a new mayor. We have a new Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. So we're uh, talking with the province now about, uh, about getting that renewed. So something to watch for. Maybe part of this uh, New Deal discussion too. Uh, next slide talks about regional municipal relations. These are a little more ad hoc. So there's, there's no formal secretariat like you have with uh, FCM. Uh, the closest thing maybe you'd have to that would be uh, uh, OBCM, the Ontario Big City Mayors. Um, uh, there's also the GTHA Mayors and Chairs Forum. In the past, that's been quite active, but that's very much depended on uh, who's, who's driving it. You know, Premier, former Premier Wynne used to use that a lot uh, to talk with GTHA municipalities. Uh, former Mayor Tory engaged a lot, especially through the pandemic. They were meeting 
weekly, sometimes twice a week. Um, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, thought I'd mention them up there, is a significant actor on the, the municipal scene in Ontario. Toronto is not a member, mainly there's a, there's a bit of a history to that, but the gist of it is that, you know, we're three times the size of their, their next largest member. Um, but we do have good relations with them. We often coordinate with them, consult with them, co collaborate on certain issues, especially when we're talking with uh, other orders of government. Um, next slide talks about international relations. So again, there's no real formal bodies that were, uh, that were leading that. There's more issue-specific ones. So you have the, the C40 cities, the, the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence cities initiative, uh, United Cities and local governments were, were members, but we're a little more hands off there. And, and it may, you know, interest may ebb and flow with, uh, depending upon the mayor's priorities or city council's priorities. Um, so our office, you know, we provide strategic advice in the context of uh, any, any programming that's happening there, just to make sure that we're all coordinated and, and in alignment. Um, but really, again, it's the decentralized model at play. The uh, divisions have subject matter experts and they'll engage with international counterparts directly. Um, next slide talks a little bit more about uh, uh, what guides us in our international engagements. We have a policy framework. So intended, you know, they're aspirational goals. They're uh, intended to be you know, a center for research excellence and knowledge development, competitor, highly skilled and competent leadership. They're all kind of motherhood and apple pie stuff, but you know, they're things that uh, we have in mind as we enter into partnerships. And that's the end of my presentation. Hope I'm able to make up some time for you. And I do have uh, time for questions. Thank you. We'll hold questions until the end. Just reminding students that after Aretha goes, there's a chance to sit in a deputant's chair and ask questions to our three speakers, okay? So we have time for that at about 10.40. Aretha, I'm going to just pass it right over to you to keep us moving along. Thank you very much, Pamela. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, as I mentioned, uh, I mentioned I'm the Chief of Protocol with the City of Toronto. I have been in this job for just over three years. Funnily enough, my first day was the day they told us not to go home because of the pandemic. So I was sort of almost two years doing this job virtually, and now coming back into the office, it's like a brand new job as the world comes back and starts back up again. But I've been at the city for about 21 years. Um, I am so excited today to speak to you about the work that my team and I do in strategic protocol and external relations. Uh, not many people really understand what protocol is, so I'm going to kind of pull the hood back a little bit on like what actually what actually happens, what's the purpose. So I'm excited to share my journey in this role with you, and if I can excite you about it and make you curious about a current municipal uh, government, then I think this for me is a morning very well spent. So. What we're going to talk about a little bit today, next slide, please. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work that we do, but in order to do that, I think I need to talk a little bit about my journey of how I got here, because people are probably wondering, how do you get a job as a chief of protocol? Like, where does, where does that come from? So I'll, along with that, I'll tell you a little bit about what protocol is, uh, what that means in the municipal landscape, and why it's important, and who is it important for. So we'll, I'll go to the next slide. So this is the crazy little grid of my career journey. Um, I started out in TMU. I was in the fashion program and graduated with a Bachelor of, of, of Arts. That's kind of where it started. So if anybody had said to me back then, I would be sitting here with you, I'd be like, there's no way. I'm never gonna, government is not my thing. There's no way I can even possibly think about that. I had had a job lined up to go to London to work in Fashion Week, apprenticing on fashion shows. The market crashed, that job fell apart, and I had to figure out what I was going to do. I ended up going to a temp agency, and I got a job, funnily enough, uh, at Queen's Park, uh, working with the NTP government during the time of Bob Bray. I had no idea, I had no clue about a thing about government, really. I'd been really involved in student government, but I never really thought about government itself. Anyways, that was kind of the beginning of some lifelong journey. I worked in there, I did tour and advanced work for, with Bob Bray. Um, we lost the election, as everyone knows, and then I had to figure out, like, what's next? I did a little stint provincially in the, in the, in the Ministry of Health. Didn't love that so much. And then I'm like, okay, what am I going to do now? 
I ended up working at TV Ontario with Peter Herndorf. I was an executive assistant for him. And if many of you know him, he's sort of like this, he was the sort of the sultan of the arts. I learned a lot from him about relationship management. He was famous for his Christmas cards of which he sent 4,000 out per year that were all handwritten. Um, and that to me was the beginning of understanding the importance of relationships and keeping connection with people. So I did that for a little bit. Then I went over to work at Harbor Fund Center. I was a community arts programmer there working with communities to help build their summer programs. How can we highlight and spotlight your community and your culture and what's important to you? So I did that for those one of my best jobs. I loved that job. And then I ended up moving over to the city of Toronto and that's kind of where it started. I was in the special events program and I was involved actually in the first, the, the creation of the first Rue Blanche in the city of Toronto. So that was a very exciting time. Um, and from there, I moved over to um, the partnership office with the city. So I was involved with finding money, building city programs, finding money to support city initiatives. And I like that again, help with my relationship building skills. I jumped out, went to Elections Ontario for a little bit to do partnership management, came back and worked. That's where I started with City Clerk's Office. And I had a stint doing uh, managing the accessibility portfolio with elections. How can we ensure that persons with disabilities have full access to how they can participate in an election? And then from there, I managed the public appointments office. So the public appointments is finding people to sit on the city's agencies, boards, and committees. And I was tasked with seeing how we could build the diversity on our boards because we had did not have a very good track record of that. And then here I am now today as the chief of protocol. So, you know, I often, it's taken me a long time to figure out, you look at that like, oh my God, these things are so varied. What, what makes them, what are they all the same? But I think what really drives me is really about engaging communities across our city, really understanding the importance of having government participate, having strong relationships with the communities and, and engaging with the communities that we serve. So I'm really happy that, you know, my job today still lends itself to that, although I wasn't so sure in the beginning, but it has. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, about that. And so, next slide, please. So, my journey, it's been very, not very direct. It's been pretty scenic, but I think I want to share a couple of takeaways with you as you start thinking about your own careers. Um, the path is not always going to be direct, and that's okay. Um, zigzagging is great. I think it helps you build your skills. You learn about different people, different things, um, and you may never know your final landing spot. I don't think I know my final landing spot, and I've been working for a very long time. I won't say how long, but I'm still on, the, I'm still on, on that particular journey. But I think most importantly is really love what you do, enjoy what you do, and feel like you're making a difference in whatever that is. So another little shameless plug, I've worked both provincially, I've worked municipally, I've partnered federally, and I can say that my career here municipally has been the most rewarding. Um, if you're a person who loves to see the impact of your work, if you want to encourage and champion public participation and decision making, um, and if you enjoy community, then, and then this is the place for you, and, and this is for me is why I'm here. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about protocol and what it is. Um, as I mentioned, many people don't understand it. I don't even think my family knows what I do. Um, <laughs> as I haven't really kind of worked on my, my full elevator pitch together. So definition of protocol, we would say, is a, a system of rules that explain the correct conduct and procedures to be followed in formal situations. That sounds really dry. I mean, for me, there's a lot of words in there I don't like. System, rules, conduct, <laughs> procedures, formal. Um, and protocol is based on precedence. That is the kind of the fundamentals of that. What did we do the last time? Who sits where? Who talks first? There are definitely rules around that. Um, we are a, a monarch city, we, a monarch country. We have regard for the king. Um, and in some, in some respects, pro, idea of protocol can really be seen as a colonial construct. Um, sometimes it's been about keeping people out rather than including people. So how do we look at that, especially in a city like ours, which is 50% diverse? Uh, protocol tenants are, it's about diplomacy. Um, it's about treating people the same. So we constantly have to look at that, we, how we are represented here in the city, as well as how we look on the international stage. So I can assure you, though, that you can think outside the box. Um, you can be creative in this particular field. You can have both traditional and modernized approaches to the work that you do. No one's saying we would not have regard for the monarchy. No one's saying we wouldn't do something around Remembrance Day. But we always have to look, what else can we be doing? Does everyone feel reflected 
and seen in the types of commemorations, the events, the things that we do. So we have to always keep having an equity lens on the work. Um, and I think that's where the sort of the modernization, that's where you have to find the balance. Because treating people equally doesn't the same thing as treating people equitably. So we have to unpack what that means about being equitable. Um, but that requires intentionality. It requires being meaningful. It requires wanting to connect with communities to understand how they best want to be reflected in the works that we do. It's not about what we think. It's about engaging to say, hey, we're thinking about doing this. Does this work for you? Is this the most important way for us to do it? Who are those actors that should be at the table for the work that we're doing? Um, so we have to ask those questions. So someone said to me, what is protocol? So I say now it is about doing the right thing at the right time. Um, a lot of our policies haven't been looked at since pre-amalgamation. The world's changed. So we have to always have regard for that. So what might seem like the right thing back in you know, 1999, uh, that's not going to pass muster now. So we have to always be thinking. So you can't just look at the rules because the rules might, but might not be reflective of those nuanced changes. Next slide, please. So I, I put this, I found this slide of, of uh, one of my colleagues had recently gone to the uh, JFK President uh, Library and Museum, and she took a picture of this, and I thought this was kind of interesting, because this is a document that was prepared by the Chief of Protocol for the state visit by the President of the Republic of Ivory Coast. So I looked at that document, I'm like, wow, we still do those. We still do those notes. We still give a note to the mayor when she's going to an event that talks about who she's meeting, the forms of address, where does she stand, any interesting nuances about that particular visit. What has the city done to date with that particular country? Um, we also give key points of conversation. So here's some things you could talk about if you do meet that person. So this kind of briefing note still holds true. The content might be a little bit different, but the tenants are the same. Next slide, Joan. So what is the role of, of, my, of our unit? We call it SPUR, it's just the acronym. We really are working to enhance the city's Toronto's image by recognizing our residents, the visitors and occasions in an inclusive and politically and culturally sensitive way. So that's a lot. Um, I, we do that through recognizing and acknowledging days of significance, through civic recognitions that we do, ceremonies, commemorations. And I mentioned that we also engage our citizens, our communities on the days that are important to them. Um, we, I think, if I was to say kind of what I feel my role is, I really feel my role is about storytelling about our city. It's about in the, in the, in the, in the ceremonies that we hold, the people that we recognize, the tragedies that we commemorate, uh, the images that we capture and the places that we visit internationally. When people are gonna look back 10 years, because the protocol is a lot about milestones. It's about time, 10, 20, 30, 100 years from now. When people look back at this point in time, I really want to ensure that it is an accurate snapshot of the people of the of the city and what the, and the elected officials stood for. It's a snapshot of what was important to us at this time. The policies, the procedures, how's that reflective in the things that we've done? And who was there and how were they recognized? So that's really important. And I take that role really seriously because I've been in situations where I've gone back and tried to find some photos or videos and I'm like, oh my God, we don't have anything. It's like it's been totally erased from history, and we know that we have to do better. So we have a wave of immigration. How are we capturing those stories? How are we telling them? How are we bringing them into the city? So when I took this job, I always say to people, I took this job not for what it was, I took this job for what it could be. So that's really what I'm sort of committed to. So next slide, please. So corporate foundations, so how do, what guides our work? So we are, we do get our authority from the City of Toronto Act, which in the one line, that says, to support the mayor's role as the chief executive officer and head of council, locally, internationally, um, and, and nationally. But we also have regard for our corporate strategic plan. We wanna definitely build trust and confidence with Torontonians and our city council. It's about our commitment to people. It's about a city that protects and improves the quality of life for all. We're also banned by our, the city clerk's strategic plan, which talks about making government work. And there's also divi other divisional strategies that we need to have regard for. So things like our Confronting Anti-Black Racism Action Plan, uh, our, our Truth and Reconciliation uh, Action Plan that speaks about um, the Indigenous peoples, our Newcomer Strategy, our Senior Strategy. There's all these sort of strategies, and it's really important that we think about our work and how we can best reflect these strategies in what we're doing. If we have a, a Reconciliation Action Plan and we don't have regard for the Indigenous community when we do these events, then we're kind of at odds with what the city's saying. So we need to make sure that we're reflective in the work. Okay, next. 
Next slide. <laughs> so how do we do it? So I'm part of the city clerk's office, as I mentioned, there's 18 people that work on my team. So we lead external corporate recognition in the city. Um, we look to champion the cities on the international stage through international relations and cultural diplomacy. Um, and then for me, we really is the overlay of well, a lot of the work that we do is building on the city's commitments to equity, diversity, inclusion, and reconciliation. That, that needs to be considered. Next slide, please. So here's our focus areas. So I have a team that works on protocol services, which means organizing commemorations, celebrations, recognitions, honors, awards, and then carriage of our official symbols. And I'll get into a little bit more of a deeper dive on each of these things. It's also about historically documenting the city um, through the ceremonial documents that we produce, the photography and video services that we have. Um, and we do that through a community recognition program and then our photo video services. And then another large component, which is growing exponentially, is the advice and support that we provide through international relations and official visits. Um, and also just sort of managing cultural diplomacy and doing that for the city and our, our members of council. Next slide, please. So protocol services, what is that? So I mentioned about celebrating and commemorating achievements and milestones. Really, I mean, for me, it's really about the outcome of that. We want to make sure that our res residents feel a sense of civic pride, that they feel a sense of belonging. As you know, we are a city of immigrants. When people come here, how do they see themselves? And how are we starting to tell their stories? Uh, it's about advancing equity, diversity, and reconciliation, inclusion. It's about making sure that the city, we provide opportunities for elected officials uh, to in public participation, and that the city we share our journey, our, our, the history of our Toronto's official symbols, and I'll speak a little bit about that. So we do official ceremonies and commemorations, things like, as Paul mentioned, the Federal Conference of Municipalities, we help organize that that conference with the city manager's office. We have a series on Remembrance Week. We do a full week of, of, of ceremonies there. New that we've added now is regard for Indigenous Veterans Day. That was, we were silent on that before. We know better, we do better, so we have to, we have to acknowledge that in some way. Uh, this year, we, I'll get to that in a second. 50th anniversary of the Scarborough Civic Center. That's another thing where Moriyama, the very famous Japanese architect, recently passed away. It's the 50th anniversary of that building, so we're gonna be doing a celebration. We also organize half mastings. If someone should die, we work with the federal and provincial counterparts to half mast to lower the flag. Presentations in council, we do those where we acknowledge uh, city milestones. It could be that we've won a sporting event. It could be the city's getting an award. So we bring presentations to council to share that with the broader public and feel us as, again, a sense of pride. We're always in a ready state for official funerals. Uh, most recently, we had the death of uh, Queen Elizabeth. Um, we had to have something in the cannon in the box to go to make sure that we could immediately deliver. Once the word comes, we have to be ready to act lower the flags, put, uh, put um, ribbons on our flag poles. So there's a whole process that has to be involved in that. And then I talked about the carriage of our official symbols. We have four in the city. We have our city of Toronto flag. We have our coat of arms. We have the chain of office that the mayor wears when they go to official, official events. And then new, we have our arboreal emblem, which is the oak tree to talk about the mightiness and strength of our city and our residents. And the choosing of the arboreal emblem was done with um, in big consult and big engagement with the indigenous community to talk about the importance of trees, what these trees symbolize. And so to make sure that it was grounded um, in, in that indigenous tradition. So we do about 214 ceremonies a year. Um, many of those are unplanned. So we have a plan and we have no what we're going to be doing. And then a lot of stuff just sort of happens. Like President Zelensky's visiting to, tomorrow. Oh, the uh, president of Spain's coming. Oh, we didn't know about. So these things sort of come up as part of the routine. So we always need to be in a ready state. Um, we had two first meetings of council that no one could have anticipated. So we did those within months of each other. Next slide, please. Um, another piece here is about recognizing achievements of the of Toronto residents in our community. So this is sort of are the awards that we do. Again, strengthening civic pride, strengthening a sense of belonging. I think an important piece is, you know, that we recognize and reflect the city's diversity. Uh, with who, who are we recognizing? 
Does that speak to the 50% diversity? Are we unbalanced? Do we need to start looking at the we need to start looking at the contributions of our immigrants that have come here and also helped build the city? And then again, that residents feel acknowledged for their contributions. So we have a key to the city program that the mayor uh, responsible for. They can choose uh, who they would like to give this this honor to. Uh, it's gone to the Aga Khan. It's gone to the former cabinet minister, the Honorable Zanina Akande. Um, we've get, given it to the Raptors when they won the 2019 championship. Um, we also are now launching something called the Toronto Community Champion Awards, which we did last year. But this is something new. It's a bit of a gap. It's a way for us to honor the community organizations that we kind of see are the front lines of the front lines that have never really been acknowledged in a very significant way. And they're sort of the cornerstone of our neighborhoods and our communities. And it's important that we think about what they have done and shed light as well on what some of the issues that are happening within our within our communities, because it's definitely not homogenous. Um, so that's another way to shed some spotlight. Next slide, please. Then we also have something called community recognition. It used to be called client services. I didn't like that because I don't think residents are clients. And it doesn't really speak to the, the why were we doing this? It, it happened, it was very much, you know, somebody reaches out, we look at their request, we fill it, and we send it out. But I felt we need to look at that with a bit more intentionality. So we're kind of in the looking at it more as a community recognition type of area. Um, and it's really about acknowledging dates of significance, historical events, and programming. So again, it's to me, it's really important that people feel acknowledged and recognized for the things that are important to them, not the things that we say are important, but what are you telling us is important? And that drives how we do the work that we do. So we now have a corporate days of significance calendar, which we didn't have. It is a living, breathing document. It's, a, it's an internal document. We're getting ready to post that outside. Um, and in part of that, before, we used to wait for communities to come and say, oh, can we recognize Emancipation Month? Oh, can we do something for Pride Month? But it didn't make sense. If our city policies support things like that, then we should be actually be just leading it and just doing it and working with the community to build what that particular event or ceremony would be. So I mentioned ceremonial documents. Oh, I don't have a lot of time. Ceremonial documents. Okay, maybe so ceremonial documents. Um, we've got uh, mayor's correspondence. We do proclamations, flag raisings. And I didn't get to a lot of the contentious stuff. Um, we have flag raising, sport recognition, and the Toronto sign lightings. Uh, I mentioned also our photo video services. You can go to the next slide. I'll move quickly. The next slide is really about uh, capturing the sitting term of a mayor. It's not just about taking the photos. It actually historically captures what did we do at this point in time, what was important to us, who was there, and why, why we did it. It also helps with research. If you're looking for research on photos, you can do that. Next slide, please. Uh, international relations is also a big part of our office. We do um, a lot of diplomatic affairs. We uh, help with inbound and outbound missions. We take care of official gifts, um, and we do global acknowledge exchanges. More and more international cities want to come together to talk about common issues like housing, density, uh, newcomers. So we work a lot to develop exchanges with countries to share best practices uh, and share the good things that we're doing and share our story. Okay, sorry about that. I'm going to talk really fast now. Next thing, uh, challenges in delivery of protocol. Uh, modernizing protocol, I mentioned it's just a challenge about balancing precedence and equity. We need to look at that um, and have more regard for that and look at more what is the role of municipal government in these places. Um, we're also guided by actions of other levels of government. We look a lot. What has the federal government done? What has the provincial government done? But then their needs and the, what they're looking at is much different. We are the closest to the people. We are the first ones that called, get called with the flags not flying or when the mayor hasn't made a statement. So looking at how we can better determine how we respond when others might not be responding. And then again, a very increased look of issues management. We have a lot of competing interests here as more people come here, people coming from the same country who may be being treated differently. So there's a lot of I call local international issues here that we have to navigate when we raise a flag or when we light the Toronto sign. So some quick examples of modernization. Next slide. Indigenous welcome ceremonies. In the new term of council, we were very intentional in creating a space for council to reaffirm their commitment to the reconciliation action plan. So we had an elder came, we did a water vessel ceremony. The water vessel was in a teapot. The teapot was given to us. We have shined that teapot and it has a permanent placement in the council chambers to remind our council members of the commitment that they have made to the indigenous. Uh, we have added the uh, Ojibwe language into the national anthem that plays at the beginning 
of Council in recognition of the, the decade two of Indigenous languages. We um, made a shift from the rainbow flag to the progress flag. We were one of the first to do that as a municipality. We also raise a rainbow flag at every civic center across the city, which we weren't doing before, because as we know, the LGBTQ community is not only here in downtown Toronto. We want people to feel recognized and seen. Uh, next thing, what's up? Now, very quickly, some of the things that we're working on uh, is really focusing on our global knowledge exchanges. We are also developing a public education and tour program as sort of ICS as the concierges of the, of the building. How do we greet and acknowledge people when they come and how do we encourage people to participate in local government? I think those are kind of the major things that I will go. I know I'm over and I don't want to take too much time. Um, so that's my the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so if you're a student and you're sitting at a desk that has a microphone, you can ask a question from where you are if you put your hand up. You just press the red button, then the mic is on, okay? Uh, or you can approach, um, if you're sitting in the back, you can approach and come up. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Since you're right there, you can go first. Okay. So this is just a general uh, question, not directed to any uh, presenter in particular. We learned last week that uh, cities are respective, uh, are creatures of their respective provinces. And we've been hearing over the last two weeks about the resort to ad hoc measures such as the strong mayor powers and then the New Deal uh, Financial Working Group to deal with the problems that uh, big cities currently face. I'm just wondering if this all points to how federalism is becoming increasingly irrelevant uh, or that might, it might stand in the way of the progress and development of big cities such as Toronto, Vancouver and Montreal? I'll try that one. Uh, I, I think, yes, there, there are certain uh, actors at the city that would probably uh, agree with that statement. And, uh, uh, and the city, in fact, uh, when the province uh, cut the size of city council in half, the, prov or the, the city collectively fought quite hard against that and ended up taking a case to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ruled, of course, that, uh, nope, you're, uh, you're a, a creature of the province. I hate that word. But, uh, but uh, you're right. It, uh, it does reflect uh, the, the way things were set up in, in 1867. And uh, I think it does point to a, a need to modernize uh, so, uh, you know, step, step by step, things like a, a, a New Deal relationship, you know, that was music to our ears to hear the Premier acknowledge that there is a structural financial challenge in experience in Toronto, that we are different than other municipalities. Um, uh, you know, I, I think the thinking is evolving all the time, and we're hopefully, fingers crossed, going to see some changes in coming years. Okay, anybody in front of a mic have a question? Or does someone want to make their way up to the other chair? Summer, you can come on over to the mic. Yeah, you can go sit too, so we can do one too. Come on over. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, hi, everyone. So I have a question to uh, Chief Financial Paul. Officer, um, is there any strategical plan to make a ne successful negotiation about increasing Toronto's share in both provincial and federal government? Yeah, no, thanks for that. Um, so that's a lot of the work that's happening right now as we're preparing for this working group. Uh, in fact, Paul, myself, and a few other people here at the city were just meeting yesterday, and we're going to be meeting again today that are gonna look at some of these opportunities where we are providing benefits to the province, to the, to the nation, where we are providing services that are extension of, uh, of a, the municipality or regional benefits, and, and those that are really distinct and unique to Toronto. So we're looking at our transit services, our shelter services, and those things of that nature. So we're starting to build together that, uh, the initial materials that are gonna support that discussion that we're gonna be having with the provincial table, and, and hopefully we'll see the federal government join us as well in those discussions. Good morning. Um, so last week, Paul Johnson talked very passionately, passionately about the importance of 
uh, sort of ground level employees, the people who are teaching swimming lessons and taking out the trash and they're sort of uh, feet on the ground first responders. When we talk about intergovernmental affairs, um, I would love to hear from each of you maybe briefly, if you could talk about the systems and processes that are in place for those employees to bring their concerns to you. Because uh, as a service worker myself, I often get the impression that a lot of decisions are made from sort of a top down or lateral decision making, such as we saw with the budget. So uh, what sort of processes are in place for those employees to voice their concerns to you and make changes? And do you have any examples of changes that have been made because of uh, ground level employees concerns that were brought up? Get start. Um, I can speak to one area where the city has made some some improvements. Um, the city previously, within the last just pre-pandemic, started a program called Communities of Inclusion. And that doesn't speak to everyone, but there was a lot of marginalized communities that didn't feel like their voices were being heard within the city. So we have Communities Inclusion. Uh, we have one for our Black staff. We've got one for with a Muslim network now. There is a, a Pride network. There is an Indigenous network, and there is an ability for those staff to come together to talk about the issues that they were experiencing in the city, and especially given the city that, you know, policy is about the safety of all, and that means mental health and wellness. It also means physical safety. So now there's a channel and a mechanism for them to address issues that they're feeling in the workplace that then get escalated up through our people in equity division and then right up to the city manager. So that's one thing that I would, I would say is new, it's new to the city. Yeah, and, and I was going to speak to some of those strong networks that we've developed that um, that do have a voice at the table and are able to bring opportunities. I think another thing that's also important, and, and we're actually just embarking on uh, on a new version of it now, um, is a, a process where we actually seek out input and engagement with our staff. And information comes forward, and I know we collect it across each of our divisions, where we can where we get feedback and direct feedback from staff around, you know, what are the challenges that they're seeing? What are the highest areas of opportunities? Um, what is working, what isn't working, and then we take that information back as divisions and we help model our work plans and we help model some of our uh, transformational opportunities based on that feedback. When I had come back to the city in 2019, we had just completed the last survey and we developed an entire working group that was always established around how do we take this feedback and actually make advancements. And, um, and I can tell you, heading into this new engagement survey, which begins, I think, in a couple of weeks, we're already trying to find creative ways of ensuring that our teams are participating. We're talking about kind of group functions, getting people together, blocking time to make sure that they can provide that input and feedback to help uh, drive more change. And from an intergovernmental perspective, um, we do, uh, we, try, we try and do a very broad outreach and uh, just a, across city divisions. So just to give you an example, when uh, uh, we, we do a pre-budget submission to the, the province or the federal government. We have a, kind of a within the city network of uh, people across all divisions that we reach out to for input. And, uh, uh, and, and when the province or the federal government comes out with their budget, we also do an analysis of that and we reach out to those the same people to get their input on, on how it affects them and, and how we should be responding to it um, you know there's, there's an email distribution list there's about 104 people on that list right now uh, they're you know put into place by the management in that division they're not managers necessarily they're usually policy people from across the city I, I mean to your point it, it, it will vary how engaged individual staff are according to those divisions and according to the program area but uh, we do try and take a very broad view and, and get input from uh, all quarters. Because as I said, we're not subject matter experts in our office. We're, we rely very heavily on uh, the expertise of, of people on the ground. Iterative, for sure, yep. Last question, thanks. Hi, oh, can you hear me? Okay, thank you for teaching us this morning. Um, my question is for Aretha. I really, really enjoyed your presentation. I'm fascinated by what you do. I love that you consider your role to be storytelling. As an urban planner and historian, I feel, I believe the same. Um, and 
I really liked what you said about wanting to ensure residents feel a sense of civic pride and belonging, because if they don't, they won't participate in the public participation and decision-making process, and there will always be a gap between what is being implemented and what they want. Um, when you talked about the Toronto Community Champion Awards, um, I was wondering, what are your, some of your main strategies to engage the people in a way where they feel like actions are not performative, like in a way where they feel like, how do you encourage people to want to participate? Because I feel like sometimes they might feel a disconnect. Well, I can say a lot of people actually don't know how they can participate. I think municipal government is one of the least understood. We have the lower vote, voter turnout. I think we are launching a, relaunching a program that we call, that we have called My Local Government and being really intentional and proactive of going out letting people, how can you participate? How can you have your say? How do you find out who your council is? How do you sit on a board? How do you run for to be an elected official? And I think the city, we have to be intentional. We have to open up to say, here's how you can do it. And I'm not sure we've done the best job at that. We tend to do it when it comes time for an election or we got the budget. And you know, how do we keep, it's a cycle, right? This, the cycle is, uh, it has to, you have to think about the, the whole cycle and also meeting people where they're at. It also means going out into community, not waiting for community to come to you. So going out and saying, we want you to be part of this and here's the ways that you can. Mm -hmm. So I hope that, yeah. does that help? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sure. As usual, time has flown in our time together at City Hall. Um, the last words from students are going to go to Stephanie, who's a student in the planning program at Toronto Metropolitan University. Over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so on behalf of university and college students across Toronto, I would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to you all for taking time out of your schedules to share your knowledge, experience, and perspectives with us. First, Stephen, sharing how complex it is to financially plan for a city whose annual budget is bigger than some provinces, mind-boggling. And for Paul, the image of the mayor, Olivia Chow, with different levels of government was hilarious and really helped illustrate Toronto's relationship with the provincial and federal governments. And for Aretha, um, expanding the definition of protocol to include um, equity, an equity lens and allowing for creative and modern thinking, or in short, doing the right thing at the right time. Like Dr. Robinson said, this is a unique learning opportunity and your willingness to engage with students and address our questions and concerns has not only broadened our understanding of local governance, but also deepened our appreciation for the individuals who work tirelessly to make Toronto a better place for all its residents. Once again, we extend our sincerest thanks to all the municipal representatives who participated in this session, as well as Dr. Pamela Robinson for facilitating this session. Your contributions have made a lasting impact on our educational journey and has helped us understand the nuances in shaping the city we like to call home. So I bet you when you came in today, if I'd asked you what are the ingredients for a well-run city, you might have said, oh, the budget needs to function or the garbage needs to pick up on time. I think our three speakers today really showed us what happens when you lead, when you start with values, when you bring wisdom to the table, but also when you open yourself up. Across all three of you, you had very different ways of sharing your ideas, but I just want to say like I learned a lot about the value and the importance and the incredible skill it takes to take a complex idea and communicate it in a way that's simple but not simplistic. I think you honored the complexity but also shared ideas in a way that we can all learn from. So thank you very much for that today. Okay, so this wraps up session two for us. We all get to go back to our home institutions next week. Um, it's been really fun to be all in the round. I can't wait to roll up sleeves with the students in my class. And I think the other instructors probably feel the same way. It'll be really great to hear how you're all doing. We're back on October 6th and the session focuses on building an equitable city. So it promises to be another really important and interesting opportunity to learn. I just wanna say thanks to the students who stepped up and asked questions today. You really ask good questions and asking good questions helps us all learn and it evolves the way in which we govern our city. So that's just an open invitation to keep asking good questions. Um, thanks again today for everyone who came. Um, speakers, do you have a few minutes if people wanna come up and approach you with individual questions? Great. Um, and just a reminder that all of the students who are participating across York, OCAD, U of T and TMU, you have a collaborative learning assignment. So if you haven't yet found a partner, 
There's, I think, exactly 120 students in the room right now. Um, this is a good chance to turn to your neighbor to find someone to talk to about that because it's only 11 o'clock and your classes all officially go till 12. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great day. Bye.